Good evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurok people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and I also pay my respects to all other Aboriginal and Islander people here tonight. Welcome to this very special event of La Trobe University's Idea, Ideas and Society series. Thank you so much for coming out on this very cold night. My name is Richard Larkins and I have the privilege of being the Chancellor of La Trobe University. I would like to acknowledge the founder and ongoing convener of our Ideas and Society series, Emeritus Professor Robert Mann, who I'm delighted to say is with us tonight. Tonight's topic is one of fundamental significance to the future of Australia. There are many issues relating to Indigenous Australians which are still unresolved, 230 years after Australia was colonised by British settlers and convicts, throwing into turmoil the lives and cultures of the many clans who had lived in Australia in harmony with nature for tens of thousands of years. The story of these 230 years has often been a bleak one for Indigenous Australians, who in many cases have been dislocated from their traditional lifestyles and disconnected from their culture. Although there are many stories of outstanding individuals who have thrived, too many of our Indigenous people have struggled with the combination of dispossession, welfare dependence, alcohol and other drug abuse, and increasingly the diseases of the Western world, with most recently the transition from infectious diseases to diabetes, kidney and heart disease. Unemployment and incarceration rates remain as indicators of ongoing dysfunction for many Indigenous communities. In what is often perceived as disastrous past and a dire future for our Indigenous people, there are some positive signs. The sorry statement in Parliament 10 years ago gave some common ground to move on from the attitudes and policies of the past. Life expectancy for Indigenous Australians is rising and infant death rates are falling. There are many Indigenous Australians making outstanding contributions to the Australian community and the number of Indigenous graduates from our universities is rising markedly. Whilst in the past we had very few Indigenous doctors and lawyers, we now have many. But much remains to be done and amongst unresolved issues are a treaty, constitutional recognition and a worthwhile government response to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which we see displayed so beautifully here tonight. Tonight we are fortunate to have two outstanding public intellectuals bringing their perspective to the issues facing Indigenous Australians. Noel Pearson comes from the Gugu Yimadu community of Hope Vale on southeastern Cape York Peninsula. He's a law graduate from the University of Sydney He's the founder and director of strategy of the Cape York Partnership and he co-founded the Cape York Land Council. For the past three decades, he's been recognised as one of Indigenous Australia's most important leaders, an original thinker, a powerful advocate for education, self-help and full engagement of Indigenous Australians in the globalised economy without the surrender of their cultural identity. Among many other roles, he has served as a member of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians and the Referendum Council. As those who watched Gough Whitlam's funeral service will know, he's also a powerful and compelling orator. Professor Megan Davis is a Pro Vice-Chancellor and Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of New South Wales. She's a member of a key United Nations Indigenous Forum and she's also a member of both the Expert Panel on Constitutional Recognition and the Referendum Council. Megan has written a series of powerful essays on the challenges facing Indigenous women, the struggles of her people for both self-determination and meaningful constitutional recognition, and the hopes invested in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Megan is a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, the Academy of Social Sciences, and a Commissioner on the Australian Rugby League Commission. The Q&A session will be moderated by Dr Julie Andrews, a lecturer in Aboriginal Studies at La Trobe University and a PhD graduate from La Trobe. 
She's worked in higher education for more than 25 years as an educator, policymaker, and academic. Dr. Andrews' family is connected to the Kamara Gunja Aboriginal Reserve, and she's a proud member of the Dulin Yagan family clan of Yulupna, and she's a proud member of the Briggs family clan of the Yorta Yorta, Yorta tribe. Please welcome our panellists, Mr. Noel Pearson and Professor Megan Davis, who will conduct most of this evening's session. Thank you. So, Noel, mm -hmm. I thought we could start with rugby league. <laughs> I, was, I was up in Broome for the Native Title Conference and flew down to Melbourne for the State of Origin and back again, so <laughs> disappointing first result, but I'm sure we'll come back. So speaking of Queensland, I thought we'd start, I was gonna start by talking about the Whitlam oration too, but I'm just over your shoulder, of course, is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We thought we'd bring the original painting down and looking at it, Noel, I'm like, <laughs> there was a lot of work that went into that, a lot of work. Um, Tonight we thought we'd talk about the constitutional reform process. Um, Noel and I met in 2011 when the expert panel was constituted by the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, and have worked together ever since, including on the most recent iteration, the Referendum Council from 2015 to 2017. Um, so I think it's five mechanisms now in eight years, and um, six reports on constitutional recognition in eight years. It's a lot, mm. it's a lot. Um, so I was reflecting on that in terms of what happened from the expert panel to what happened to the Referendum Council. And I've, in recent times, thought, well, maybe what happened was there was a shift in emphasis, right, from equality, non-discrimination, to last year being very different. It was more about Blackfellas standing up and going, we want to be recognised for being different. And we want you to recognise that within the structures of the state. But before we get there, I was reflecting on your Whitlam oration, because I thought it was really powerful, as, as many people did. Um, but especially when you spoke about the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, I went to Marcia Langton's Kep Enderby lecture two nights ago where she spoke about the emancipatory impact that that had on Aboriginal people. I mean, it's the one example that you can look at of the of United Nations human rights having a very real impact. But I just thought we could start by having a chat about something you said in that oration about, you know, some of the very last vestiges of the protection era being in front of Queensland um, and also being dismantled after the Act in 1975. Did you want to maybe say a little bit about that? Um, but in particular, that the impact of that upon you as a lawyer and a young Aboriginal man and how that's influenced the work that you've done in this space. The old Native Affairs Act and the Protection Acts that preceded it was the defining condition of my childhood. The, it was the politics of my early life in the mission. It was something that the agitators in our community wanted to remove. It was the, it was the um, aim of our people to be relieved of the, what they saw as the repressive regime of the Queensland government on our lives. Um, and so when Gough passed the Queensland Discriminatory Laws Act in 1975, um, there was a, it, it was a huge moment for us, very huge moment for us. It, together with the Racial Discrimination Act, then provided the means by which we could challenge the state of Queensland in relation to its discriminatory laws. Without that legislation, the 
the bureaucratic regime that governed the missions and the government settlements of Queensland would have remained in place. And without the Racial Discrimination Act, the important work done by a WIC elder called John Kawata in challenging the Jilke-Peterson government would not have been possible. Um, the victory of Kawata in 1981 in, in that case, where the Queensland government had sought to prevent him from acquiring his traditional homelands with federal funds, um, the deal had been done with the pastoralist, but the Queensland government stepped in and said, our policy is Aboriginal people are not allowed to own pastoral leases. And the case went up to the High Court and Kawata won, but, if, but prior to that, the Bajilki peterson government had created a national park of the land. Um, four to three was the victory in the High Court. And just as Wilson was against us, mm. is a strange irony of history that um, he was one of the three in minority. It was a very close call. Um, subsequently in, the, in Mabo number one, he was against us as well. It was a very strong states rights judge which explains the fact that he was against us in those two very important cases. Um, nevertheless, Kawada's victory was important and then subsequently the Mabo litigation was going to be killed in 1985 by Bajilki Peterson and by a narrow victory um, it was overturned by virtue of the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act. So both of these cases, very important in the fight for Indigenous rights, happened in Queensland and happened against the bajilki Peterson government. And, and without the federal law passed by Whitlam in 1975, those advances in human rights across Australia would not have been possible. And I suppose I raise that um, because I think it's important in understanding how we got to Uluru and the voice to the parliament. I think it's important to understand where we started with constitutional recognition in terms of the expert panel. Some people say this process of constitutional recognition started in 1999 with John Howard. Um, and if people remember, that was the Republic referendum in which Howard proposed to put a preamble in the constitution that recognised multiple polities and people and things, um, like mateship, although I think that was rejected. Um, so in, in, in that particular proposed preamble, there was um, the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their culture. And I think um, one cautionary tale for us that emerged, I think, during um, that we keep reminding ourselves of was that at the time, the key land councils, the Central Land Council, the Northern Land Council, the Cape York Land Council, Ab the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission all rejected the formula of words that was used um, and they moved ahead anyway, regardless of the fact that we didn't agree to that language. But that, some people pinpoint that, 99 is the recognition point. Then we get to 2011, um, and in December 2010, Gillard constitutes this expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution um, as a consequence of the hung parliament. Um, the Greens and the independent Rob Oakeshott held her to this agreement that there was multi-party support for recognition, so let's move on it. So what I find um, interesting then, Noel, is that the work of the expert panel um, was very much influenced by non-discrimination. And I think partly because we just came off the back of um, amendments to two very key acts, um, 
the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act in the Highmarsh Island case and the Native Title Act, whereby the race power was purportedly used to pass discriminatory legislation. So I think, and I don't know if you recall at the time, but it was the, 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 the expert panel was very much imbued with the sentiment that we needed a non-discrimination clause in the Constitution. Yes. And um, it received Section 116A, which was the primary reform that we took out to the Australian people, received overwhelming support from civil society sector um, and, and those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that we did talk to, although we didn't do a comprehensive consultation with them. So 116A we handed down, but it was almost immediately rejected. And I don't know if you remember, but with a week to go before the report was handed down, there were reports in the Australian that non-discrimination was the primary reform and that it would lead to the reintroduction of spearing and child brides and, and other things. I think it's really important to understand in terms of the voice to parliament and what emerged at Uluru is that section 116A and the idea of a non-discrimination clause was just not political, politically saleable. Did you want to talk a bit about that? So I was a strong advocate for that provision. We have the Racial Discrimination Act as an act of parliament that can restrain state and territory governments. But it is not a restraint against any subsequent Commonwealth legislation that might be inconsistent with the Racial Discrimination Act. So we don't have a, we don't have a complete guarantee of, against racial discrimination in our Commonwealth law. Putting a protection against discrimination in the Constitution would bind not just the states and territories, but would bind the Commonwealth as well. So that was why we alighted on the idea of Section 116A as a protection that would be binding on the Commonwealth and not just the states. Uh, as Megan said, the polling that was done on behalf of the expert panel in 2011 was very positive about it. It was, of the five or so proposals, it was the most popular with the Australian community, with Liberal voters as well as Labor voters. It, it, it had very strong um, support from the pollsters. Some of the other proposals, such as recognising Australia's indigenous languages, um, you know, that, that was the least popular, strangely, and we ought to spend some time reflecting on that sometime. Uh, it was the most benign of the lot. Like, it was just a statement of, a statement of value about recognising the indigenous languages of Australia. It would actually have no kind of com compelling power in relation to the way governments could work. But nevertheless, it was the least popular, and I, I sweated a lot of blood arguing the case for the languages provision to no avail, because it, apparently the pollsters told us that there was, there was strong resistance in Australia. Um, other provisions related to what, Megan? Um, amending the race power, yeah. inserting a statement of recognition. So changing the power from the Commonwealth may be able to legislate in relation to race to either Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or Indigenous Australians or something like that, or Indigenous affairs. So changing the, car, the, the, the form of words that were adopted in 1967 to take race out of that clause. And, and there was also a preambular provision to the power with some words of acknowledgement. The 2011 expert panel recommended that those preambular words 
should just sit in front of the indigenous affairs power, not at the head of the constitution as a whole. And this was sought to relieve the argument that, um, you know, all oh, those preambular words might be used to interpret the rest of the constitution mm. and so on. But the main substantive provision was the guarantee against racial discrimination. And we went out following 2011 and immediately hit a barrage of opposition. One clause Bill of Rights were, was the campaign against racial discrimination protection. You're just going to create a one clause Bill of Rights in the Constitution. And uh, there would be an almighty objection to that by conservatives in the parliament. The government wouldn't support it. And, and a campaign in the wider community would be thwarted by the government's, uh, the opposition, then opposition's re, uh, resistance to the notion of putting a rights clause into the constitution. Now, we went out there batting. All of us were pushing for the expert panel's proposals. And I suppose over the course of the two years following the report, I began to think that we're just not going to succeed with Section 116A. And, um, and I started to think about, you know, what is, what is our strategy going to be um, in relation to this implacable opposition to a rights-based clause. And that eventually led to the concept of, uh, well, if, if the High Court isn't going to protect us via a rights clause, um, well, we want to have a say in relation to any laws that are passed so that we can politically object to discriminatory laws. And that was cast as the alternative to a, to a racial discrimination protection, that Indigenous people be given a voice um, to Parliament uh, to critique and politically object to any pro law proposals and policy proposals that may be discriminatory and that may not be acceptable to Indigenous Australians. I think, I think, I think this is a really important point because, you know, after Uluru, there were people that were, like, you know, clutching their pearls, saying, what have you done? This is shocking what happened to non-discrimination. Um, but when we look back at 2012, 2013, we were pretty isolated, right? No one was coming in to, to help bat for 116A. Yeah. You know, we were abandoned by, you know, there's 5,000 submissions, but th there wasn't anyone really backing us in and helping build a momentum and a people's movement towards a non-discrimination clause in the Constitution. Um, we were told time and time again, it's not going to fit with the political culture. Um, it, it's not going to fly, one clause Bill of Rights. And I think... I think then the thinking and the work that you did in terms of thinking, well, what's the alternative then? So rather than taking a judicial approach, a legal approach, let's think about taking a political approach, a kind of upfront um, uh, reform, structural reform that will allow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to have an upfront impact and input into laws and policies that impact upon them. Um, and a lot of work went into that, hey, Noel? <laughs> three to five years of work and thinking and drafting and around an alternative approach to um, judicial entrenchment of rights. If I just... I'll return to the voice, because I, um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, 116A, in my view, um, actually reflects a culture in Australia, a culture of law reform that people have really allowed themselves or shrunk themselves to the inertia of the political or politicians and the parliamentary system in that people are keen to make continual law reform submissions. Um, 
but the political strategy that's required to get some of these reforms up is just absent. Um, and I think, I'll return to it later, but you've taught me a lot around political strategy and the importance of strategy. You just can't come up with these great ideas about reform. You need to take some responsibility um, to, to get those reforms up. Um, but I'll, I'll return to that in a moment because the other thing I wanted to raise with you was, so post-expert panel, we had these options that were primarily about removing the word race from the constitution um, and this non-discrimination clause. Um, and we pretty much received a closed political door on that. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Um, but something else happened from about 2012, 13, if I remember the election properly. Actually, I think my elections are wrong. To, to about 2015 when Turnbull appointed the Referendum Council. And that is Indigenous policy. And um, I raise this, in particular, the Indigenous Advancement Strategy that was introduced by the, the, the Abbott government. I raise this because I think um, often in public debate about what happened from the expert panel and the race clauses to Uluru and this voice to Parliament is that people don't quite appreciate just how dramatic and just how destructive that policy was in our communities around Australia. And you've written about the Indigenous Advancement Strategy a lot. And as you know, when we went out to the dialogues to all these regions, it was a, it was a primary issue that people raised about the voicelessness and powerlessness that had been um, really entrenched as a consequence of the IAS. You spoke about, you've spoken about parasitic NGOs and bureaucracies feeding off the Indigenous world. And you've also lamented that most Australians have no idea that the greatest beneficiaries of investment of Indigenous funds are non-Indigenous organisations who are not based in our communities. Could you talk a little bit about the IAS? Because I think it really had a huge impact upon Uluru. This is a really difficult one because every other day mention is made of $34 billion being spent on behalf of blackfellas by the Australian budget. 34 bill, I think it's up to 36 now. Um, and those are Productivity Commission figures, um, and it's therefore very difficult to explain to people that that calculation is based on nominal grants to states and territories with counting Indigenous people in those jurisdictions. So there, that $34 billion is embedded in the Queensland Department of Health allocation the Queensland Department of Education allocation, and the justice system, and the infrastructure, and everything else. It's not a true sum. It is what the states and territories get nominally based on Aboriginal headcounts in those jurisdictions. The real amount of Indigenous-specific funding is about $5 billion, and that's determined by the Minister for Indigenous Affairs under the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. So these lurid figures that are put out every other day saying there's $34 billion and we're not seeing a return for it, quite correctly, we are not. But all of that is embedded in the state and territory distribution system. That is why very little of it hits the ground. But in relation to the, the, the direct funding that the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs controls, um, well, when ATSIC closed down, the budget was just a fraction of what is now spent. Indigenous Affairs funding has grown since the, the dismembering of ATSIC. And Indigenous organisations delivering services has collapsed because the government moved away from providing operational funds for Indigenous organisations and said, you compete for tenders. And uh, you, you get your operational money out of your admin fees on these tenders. So you've got to compete with Mission Australia. You've got to compete with the Smith family. You've got to compete with every 
NGO run by a church or non-church organisation. And the McClure recommendations in relation to this basically gutted Indigenous organisations. They couldn't compete with the large NGOs on delivering service programs. So the scene today, the, the so-called, remember that period back in the Howard government when every other second word was Aboriginal industry? Well, the Aboriginal industry today is run on behalf of and by whitefellas, NGOs and for-profit organisations. Uh, the kind of carcass of indigenous disadvantaged is, um, you know, the, the parasites on that carcass is largely non-indigenous. And they, they have crept into every corner of indigenous service delivery, from arts centres to employment to training to, uh, you know, even... Um, even the Community Development Employment Program, all of those programs that operate in communities are delivered by non-Indigenous NGOs. Taken over the whole scene. And because they're now the industry, there's no objection to it. There's no controversies about industries anymore. We don't hear about the Aboriginal industry anymore because the people who own these businesses are uh, ex-bureaucrats and politicians. You want to know how much they were charging per week for one child in out-of-home care? A kid from Cape York, you could earn 5,000 bucks a week from one child. Millionaires have been born out of child protection. And child protection budgets have gone like that in these last 10 to 15 years. But is the media interested in the rise of this industry and the controversies in relation to it? No. They were right in there when ATSIC had failed to deliver housing programs or whatever controversies there were back then, which in the scale of things were minor mm. compared to what has gone on in this past 10 to 15 years. So it's very difficult to talk about this stuff because nobody's interested in really asking the question about why it is that ex-bureaucrats, an ex-bureaucrat in charge of, say, the child safety in Queensland, resigns and sets up shop, rents a series of houses around Cairns, and their mates inside the department start farming kids out to them at 5,000 bucks per week per pop. And you've got a very nice earner going then. And you have no interest in returning kids to their families. Why would you want to? And on every bus, on every, every second large billboard, as you drive into Cairns, there's an advertisement saying, we need more foster parents. We need more people to come in and help us um, be foster parents to Aboriginal kids and to look after these kids in out-of-home care. It's an obscene situation, and it is, and yet ATSIC is still the beat noir of, of the you know, policy and political commentariat. Uh, that story, the ATSIC story is old. Mm. The story has moved on massively. And, uh, and it is a completely passive industry, treating the Aboriginal children and communities. You wait. Wait till the NDIS comes in to Cape York. You, the new... The, the new wave of industries that are going to come in on the when NDIS is implemented in, in Cape York and in remote communities, is, is going to be massive. And, um, and the results are no better. 
Who is asking that question? They kept Atzig like a dog for so long. Remember John Howard's first press conference. First press conference as Prime Minister was kicking Atzig. We haven't reflected on that. Why would a Prime Ministership start with number one topic Atzig and $400 million corruptly um, misappropriated? Not one, not one prosecution resulted. And yet his first press conference alleged that there had been $400 million lost, misappropriated from Atsik. Of course what he was doing then was locking in, locking in the battler shift and the prejudice upon which he had ridden into office. Now, it's one thing to win on the prejudice, but the ne next task after winning on the tide of prejudice is to lock it in. To make sure that the shift sticks. So that whole story of Atsik's demise and the fact that there has grown invisibly this massive new industry that treats our children, our smallest children, and our children in detention, and our people in jail as so much fodder. Mm. Well, the employment industries are obscene, and they have made multi-millionaires of people. You may as well have put a, um, put a mark on the foreheads of Aboriginal people in remote communities and say, you know, just zap them for the fee. Let them come past <laughs> a every... A barcode. Put a barcode <clears throat> on the forehead and allow these people to run, a, to run a scanner over them every 12 months to collect the $7,000 fee or whatever it is. It is a miserable scene. And the difficult argument for Aboriginal advocates is to, say, is to expose that, because mm. nobody's interested. Ex-politicians, ex-senior bureaucrats run these, run the for-profit companies that have taken over this $34 billion scene. So that's a long answer to your question about <laughs> the, the, the importance of Indigenous people having, having a voice in relation to the laws and policies uh, that apply to us. No, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you took the time to answer it so comprehensively, because I think it is such a critical story. It's a missing puzzle in... And, and by and large, Australians are very taken very well to the Uluru Statement, but it really is a missing piece of the puzzle in people struggling to understand what happened at the expert panel and, and, and what happened then at Uluru. And, um, and as I said before, there was so much pearl clutching from political elites about Uluru was so unexpected. Well, it can't. It was not unexpected at all. If you looked at the Joint Select Committee that was set up after the expert panel to, 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 to kind of consider those recommendations, the Hansard transcri transcripts from all of the trips of the committee around Australia to remote communities are, is, are a really depressing read. You can see right there when they go out to communities to say, how do you want to be recognised? Do you like the statement of recognition? People are actually talking about the impact in real time of the IAS on their communities right there and then. The stories are depressing of powerlessness and voicelessness, of their communities being gutted, um, of their autonomy being taken away. It's a really, really um, sad story. And it's really frustrating to me, post Uluru, that people um, still come up and say, what happened to a non-discrimination clause? Well, if MOB are presented with a proposal that empowers them to participate in decisions that are made about their lives and their communities, they are going to go for that proposal. They're not going to go for an entrenched right in the Constitution that sits there in case one day the Parliament 
passes discriminatory laws. And when that happens, the mob still have to raise the money to hire a barrister to conduct the litigation, to wait for the High Court to run the case, to wait for the decision, and even then you're not really sure what the outcome might be. And the truth is, during some of the dialogues in Cairns, there were people that said, the, the employment programs up here are discriminatory, we asked a Brisbane barrister about mounting a case under the RDA, and they couldn't afford the $30,000 to be able to do that. Litigation is, costs money, um, it's prohibitive to a lot of communities. So I think that story is really important about the Indigenous Advancement Strategy and the fact that this, this mythology about the Aboriginal industry, it, it doesn't exist. That money sits in mostly white hands, not Aboriginal hands. And so that story really influenced the work of the dialogues. Because when we arrived in every region, and the first day was taken up with a lot of anger. Only minimal anger at us. <laughs> mostly anger at the government, mostly anger at the disempowerment as a consequence of policies like the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. Um, I felt being out there as if, I mean, this sounds like such a Pollyanna thing to say, that politicians have no idea about the lives that people are living in, in communities. Before we get to Uluru, or at least the dialogues, I just wanted to note, so the IAS, the political elites and poli the political parties rejected 116A. Um, and then the third thing I think is important is we started to see this backlash from mob about constitutional recognition, absolutely connected to the Indigenous Advancement Strategy, but mostly driven by their rejection of symbolism. And I remember a really powerful interview that's still available on radio that you did on um, with Tiger Bales. And it was a really, I think, instrumental interview that a lot of blackfellas picked up on Twitter and social media. Um, you two had a really lovely conversation about land rights and other things um, in Queensland. But in particular, um, he, he raised those concerns of the mob that this, these reforms were not going to be substantive, but in fact the government appeared to be tracking down a route that would involve symbolic reform. Did you want to say anything about, about that? Because I think that was a really key thing at Uluru the rejection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of just symbolic reform? I think the metaphor that... And I, I attended, as you know, not all of the dialogues, attended seven out of the 12. But the metaphor that I think resonated with people that I attempted to put across time and time again was, do you want a little brass plaque put into the Constitution, acknowledging blah, blah, blah? Or do you want to put a hook at the top of the Constitution upon which we could hang legislation and hang agreements? So the, 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 that was the way I presented the dis difference between the symbolism of a plaque, you know, go down to Bunnings, get the screwdriver, and, you know, etch out a few poetic words um, and then stick it in the front of the Constitution. Or we're going to put a hook there. And, and a hook that's capable of hanging our legislative aspirations and hanging agreement making. And, you know, the, the whole course of the dialogues um, it became very clear that people want, wanted something substantive. The days of, you know, plaques at the entrance, uh, you know, at the top of the edifice uh, are over. And, and this, I didn't realise it at the time, but this approach coincided with Paul Keating's response to Megan and Marcia Langton, where he said, why would... You know, he, he, he was querulous about our constitutional reform agenda. And he asked, why would you want a recognition in a, in, a, in a miserable colonial document? Horse and buggy, I think he said. Horse and, from the <laughs> horse and buggy era. And he, and, that, and he was quite right. That, that is what the document is. 
My, my colleague Shireen was chided by Chief Justice Murray Gleeson for calling it a rule book. <laughs> he thought it's a bit more than a rule book. But that's essentially what it is. It's the rules of golf or rules of cricket. <clears throat> it distributes power, it creates institutions, and, uh, and tells us what the rules are. Um, but it is not the place for poetry. And, and so in that sense, our ideas, our approach coincided with Keating's in that if there is to be poetry, let's do it outside of the Constitution and in a place that is amenable to, to a more expansive expression of recognition. And lots of people were still fixated with the, with the, um, with the argument that, oh, you know, there's no real recognition un unless it's expressed in the Constitution. And there's still a residual um, mm. anxiety about this, that, that some, some statement of recognition should be, um, should be within the Constitution. Um, however, uh, I, everything I heard at the dialogues that we had placed a very low premium on, on, on those words being in the Constitution. Indigenous people were just not interested in putting a little brass plaque into the Constitution. And that is how we ended up with the Referendum Council recommending that a declaration be done outside of the Constitution. And that would enable more, uh, a more expansive uh, set of words um, rather than seeking to put something within the Constitution that we would have massive argument about the import of the words. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so these things all conspired, I think, the symbolism concern, the backlash among the mob, the IAS, people were in no mood to be talking about recognition, especially if it was symbolic. So I think at one point, you, me, Patrick Dodson, Kirsty Park, we went and talked to Abbott about needing another pro a process because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people hadn't been consulted on the reforms, certainly not on the expert panel reforms. There was some consultation, but certainly not comprehensive. Um, eventually, I think Abbott was... Abbott's job was taken by Malcolm Turnbull and, um, and we were able to convinced Turnbull, or at least Turnbull said he would set up the Referendum Council. Prior, prior to setting up that council, though, we did have a meeting called the Kirribilli Aboriginal Leaders Meeting um, at Kirribilli House in Sydney um, that Abbott was at and Shorten was at. And I think that's another important point just to make, that we issued a statement at that meeting, and at that meeting we said that minimalist constitutional reform would not fly that the Aboriginal leadership and the Torres Strait Islander leadership would not accept deletion of Section 25, um, moderation or a, a new race power um, and a statement of recognition. We just wouldn't accept that. Yeah, Megan, the minimalists or the, the so-called realists or pragmatists, their position was that after 65,000 years of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations occupying this continent, after 65,000 years, the deal with the newcomers of the past 200 and whatever it is, the deal should be this, that there should be some preambular words in the Constitution that we should change the 1965 words from race to indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, either. And the other thing we should do is remove section 25 of the constitution that anticipates the consequences if states and territories bar people of certain races 
converting. And section 25 is like an appendix, yeah? You can have it or you can take it out. Um, it really has no function whatsoever. And if you're concerned about the symbolic history of that provision, then, then section 25 really was directed at, at um, really directed at Chinese, not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And it was a, a copy of the provision in the United States Constitution that was to act as a disincentive from states barring people from the vote. Anyway, so that was a deal proposed. And, and I can't see how anyone could think that any decent indigenous leadership could accept that as a deal. You can talk uphill and down dale about how hard it is to change our constitution, we know that. Majority of voters in a majority of the states. We know how easy it is to whip up an hysteria in relation to indigenous people. We know the difficulty of the climb ahead, but to say that any self-respecting indigenous people could accept such a poor deal after 65,000 millennia Um, it's, it's just absurd. There's no way that minimalism was ever going to float and will ever float. The, so we ran for too long with the Recognise campaign and the Recognise campaign basically was pushing minimalism. And, uh, you know, part of our political difficulty and our strategic difficulty was that that campaign um, did not put to bed the option of minimalism mm -hmm. early enough mm -hmm. and allowed the conversation to go on for too long thinking that somehow um, indigenous people would be persuaded that that, that kind of minimalism was the only thing we could ever get from the Australian people. And it was touch and go there, I think. You know, the, uh, I, I, agree. I really, I was really <laughs> worried that the recognised campaign would ultimately take the commanding heights of this debate and we would be stuck with minimalism. Um, but I think the voices that came out of the dialogues um, in 2016-17 that led to the Uluru Statement um, really, really uh, killed the recognised campaign. Um, you know, Megan, you'll recall that the, the whole concept that was discussed during the dialogues that led to Uluru was that we've got to stage this thing. Mm. We first need a voice. And the voice has got to be eminent. It, it's too late in the day to talk about a legislated structure. Of course, the structure will have to be legislated. The details of its functions and its constitution and its membership and so on. Yes, Parliament will need to articulate that in legislation. But its status has to be grounded in the constitution. Enshrined in the Constitution is the words used in the Uluru Statement. Enshrinement. Um, in other words, it has to have the status of the Constitution. The body has got to be a, a body mandated by the Constitution. And it should be representative of the First Nations of the country, the original sovereign peoples of the country. And it will be those peoples who then negotiate a treaty or a makarata, as the words of the Uluru Statement puts it. Yeah? Create a voice, set up a makarata commission and negotiate a makarata. They're staged. 
and, uh, and indigenous. So we talked about walking through doors, two doors. First door is constitutional reform. The second door is the door to treaty. And this was talked uphill and downdale through the dialogues and ultimately reflected in the words of the Uluru Statement. So those who say that, well, tr forget CONREC, let's have the treaty. Mm. Well, who's a treaty going to be negotiated with? Who's going to stand on the indigenous side of the tre treaty negotiations? That is why the voice is so important, imperative. And a voice with constitutional standing will be in a position to negotiate, to treat with one another in relation to the things we did not treat about in 1770. Cook had instructions, but he never done it. And they didn't do it in 1788. They didn't do it in 1901. They didn't do it in 1938. We didn't do it in 1970. We didn't do it in 2001. And in 2020, it's 250 years mm. since the original villain appeared on the scene. So we have a chance to do it then, to treat with one another in relation to the things that we have never treated with one another about. And that is the terms upon which ancient Australia continues within the new Australia. That's what we have to treat about. And it's not good enough. It is not good enough to say, well, it wasn't done in 1770 and now it's too late. It wasn't done in 1770 and why are you bringing this identity politics stuff up again? Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that is not an answer. And this grievance about the failure to treat will be, we will condemn our future generations to enduring this grievance for as long as it takes for us to eventually get around to it. We have an opportunity in 2020 to initial the start of treaty negotiations to treat with one another in relation to those things we never treated with each other about, despite the moral chasm that has opened up about the place of blackfellas in this country. It's a massive chasm. 3% of the population, 30 to 40% of the prison population. 3% of the population, 40 to 60% of children in child protection in various jurisdictions. Short lives. So I think we have an opportunity and we have a chance. I think we've made some mistakes. Progressive people should have come behind Uluru forthwith mm. in quick alignment. We needed ducks lined up. And we had two of them in line. We had Uluru, the first duck, and then we had the referendum council in complete alignment. And then what happened the day after Uluru? Did you hear the commentary in the weekend? It was a big AFL gala dinner in this town on the Saturday. And people started arming and ahhing. There was a wobble in that third phase. It took a very long time for the Labor Party to make its position clear. 
when all of the progressive forces needed to be on the same page and in alignment and in concert with the strategy. It took weeks and months before there was complete alignment. And even now, I'm not even sure. I'm not either. Some of the progressive organisations in the country still haven't endorsed it. The AMA came out the other day and put in a strong submission of support. Many organisations around the country, but some organisations haven't, like the ACTU. We've got a Labor Party endorsement, but we're not good enough for ACTU endorsement. And people took too long as well. The Law Council came out and endorsed, endorsed Uluru, but they endorsed it in the very week that Turnbull rejected it, in October. And yet that was done in May. And the last thing I want to complain about, well, <laughs> there's two things I want to complain about. <laughs> the other one is, is that, you know, the Uluru was an important act of self-determination. Mm. You can't get such a rigorous process as Megan and Pat Anderson chaired consulting with hundreds and hundreds of people <coughs> over 12 points of the compass in Australia. There, it was the high watermark of a self-determination process. There, nothing as rigorous as that has ever been done on a national scale. And we produced a level of consensus that was unprecedented. And I would say unprecedented for any community in Australia. Mm. You can't tell me any other sector in Australia has had the degree of consensus that was achieved behind that statement. And yet we have a whole lot of people that were never there, never part of the process, umming and ahhing. That's one complaint. <laughs> the other complaint <laughs> is... Is Guy Rundle. And I, I raise him not because he's of any interest or anything, but because Robert's to blame for him. I published, uh, you remember my speech for Charlie Perkins? I gave the inaugural oration in honour of Charlie Perkins at Sydney University in 2001. And I, I have this distinction of which nobody is aware. The distinction of having my oration in honour of Charlie Perkins published in Quadrant when Robert was there and Arena when Guy Rundle was there. I, I don't know if I, there, was, there was deliberate mischief on my part when I gave it to the supreme kind of Marxist magazine and the supreme conservative magazine, but he has never forgiven me for that. <laughs> and has been like a you know, dog chasing the caravan that's pissed off down the highway <laughs> ever since. And I have a complaint about him and I'll just utter it tonight. Because we, I actually, we convened a very early days discussion about constitutional recognition. The Cape York Institute did in a seminar at Melbourne University in the early 2000s. And I can't nail down exactly the date that we had this. And it was the initial, initial articulation of some of the ideas that I've argued ever since. One of which was we need a counterclockwise strategy going from the right to the left, yeah? If we're going to get 
majority of voters in the majority of the states, we need to go for the 90% strategy. In other words, you've got to find common ground with the right. I articulated that at this Melbourne University seminar in 2001 or two or whatever, and I specifically invited Rundle. So, you know, the, the kind of underpinning strategy that I've pursued for 18 years, Rundle was at the inaugural unveiling of the strategy. So he's either completely dishonest or completely dumb. And, and his, his, um, his pursuit of me, which is, you know, I've, I've never before uttered a comment about it in 18 years of ad hominem abuse from him, from a clown that does nothing in, re in the real world. You know, he came in the long black jacket, like Lennon at the Finland station, <laughs> you know, doing a perpetual loop of the, of the, um, of the station, anyway. It's, it's been difficult to get the left to understand our reasoning in reaching out to the right. Yeah. My whole conviction has been right. My friends on the left are not going to be happy. They're not going to understand. But we have to pitch a stake over in the 90%, what I call the, the 4 o'clock position on the clock. Because, you know, previously I'd been hunting around about 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Glebe, West End, Carlton, yeah? That's 8 o'clock. That's easy. But you go down to the 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock position, you've got to go to places like Charleville, Roma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Winton, the Sunshine Coast. <laughs> 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 and anyway, so th that's my complaint with the left, that they never stuck with us. You know, we, we needed to be smart. We needed to understand that we have to hunt on all points of the clock. No use preaching to the converted. No use preaching to the converted. We've got to hunt with the unconverted and bring them into the cause of recognition. And, and so we are at a point here where we've got opportunity because there are important sections of the constitutional conservative right who are on the same page with us. They are on the same page with us in relation to the voice. In fact, their understanding of our aspirations is, is more acute than the ACT uses more acute than the law councils is. And it's because of the work we've done in trying to build a constituency around the three, four, five o'clock position. So now we're getting wound up. I'm just gonna hold you up there. Okay. Um, and just say a few things. So just for those who don't know, Guy Rundell has written a piece today saying that we sh you know, what is the voice? Why waste time on the voice? Let's move forth with the treaty. Um, and I think, Noel, is, you've well articulated something that the dialogues did, and that is they sequenced the reform. The reform is a sequenced reform. As Noel said, you need the First Nations voice set up before you can contemplate the Makarata Commission and agreement making. And, and, and the dialogue spoke about the fact that a lot of communities don't have the resources now to enter into treaty negotiations. They're very complex legal texts. And I think there's some members of the Victorian Federation, traditional owners here, but the Victorian process, the Victorian treaty process has shown that, you know, you need an institutional framework before you can move into negotiating agreements. They're very complex legal things. The dialogues also said that they didn't, um, there was a lot of uh, um, families that didn't talk to each other, a lot of tensions as a consequence of the native title process. Um, and that dispute resolution services will be required before people can come together to even contemplate treaty making. 
I think the point that you're, you were making, all about the dialogues, the cleverness, the innovation of, of all of the mob that participated in the dialogues can't be underestimated and needs to be respected because it is those communities who understand their own communities. They're saying they're not ready for treaties yet. They're saying, let's set up this voice to parliament first and then we'll contemplate moving on to a Makarata commission. And it has been frustrating to see people just kind of endorse the Uluru Statement, but just cherry-pick the reforms they want. It's really important to read the Referendum Council report and understand why the reforms are sequenced. And it has been disappointing post-Uluru, those who we thought would support the reforms, um, and a lot of progressive individuals and organisations um, question it because the non-discrimination clause is not there, because the race power is not there because they don't want a voice and they want to move to a treaty. And I think that's something that you taught me very early on in this process about the importance of the political strategy, which you just spoke about. When your monthly piece came out, which was called Betrayal, a lot of people were like, well, we could have told Noel Pearson that, that the Conservatives would have said no. Um, and I, thought, I was thinking about that, about what you were saying, about all of the reforms that people come up with and take no political responsibility whatsoever for having them implemented. And it does mean that you have to talk to both sides of Parliament. And we heard people post all the route, even our own mob, when we would say, we have to go to Parliament House, we have to go talk to Shorten, we have to talk to Turnbull. People would say, oh, I'm not going to Parliament, I'm not talking to politicians, I hate Turnbull, I hate Shorten. You know, just, just not taking the responsibility that's required to get this reform up. And it's really, really hard work. It's really, really hard work and it's really, really tiring. I think it's, um, I think it's really unfair that the voice is being dismissed on the basis that people say there is no detail. There, there's detail. There's, there's substantial detail there. What the, what the dialogues did say was instead of amending the race power the voice could play a role in monitoring legislation that's passed under the race power and under the territory's power. This was a very clever legal innovation, a very clever constitutional innovation that no constitutional lawyer had thought about before these 1,200 people participated in these dialogues. I mean, that is a marvellous, marvellous constitutional innovation that our people have contributed to this to this discussion to this debate. And I think all credit should be paid to them. They're criticised because oh, people say it's too conservative. But, but we worked within the confines of what are the Liberal, Democratic and Westminster principles that are our Australian constitutional and legal system. So it does respect parliamentary sovereignty. Um, it, it respects it in two ways. It, it doesn't veto the parliament in terms of decision making. Um, but in addition to that, it does, it adopts a very conventional constitutional technique used in the rest of the world called a decision to defer. Meaning we have come up with a proposal, we would like the Australian people to vote yes to this proposal, and we defer the contours and the design of that institution to, to the parliament. And it is for the parliament to design that. And that's why there's no detail. It's a decision to defer. And it's a clever decision. In any event, I will stop now because we're getting the wind up. I think we're like 20 minutes over time anyway. So um, I'll stop there. <laughs>
for, on behalf of your people at Cape York. And I also, what was important to me was your description of the Aboriginal industry and describing what it actually is to the audience. I don't think a lot of them would understand um, what is actually going on with our people. It's not just talking about um, constitution. There are other things that you um, are actually having to challenge others about. And Megan, thank you so much for bringing the Uluru Statement. It's such a historical document and it's going to go down in the history of our people. So thank you very much. I don't think a lot of us would have the opportunity to be so close to it. I also wanted to say before I open up the floor for questions, and we're only going to have a short question session. Um, but Megan, you mentioned there was a lot of work went into the Uluru Statement. And listening to both you and Noel, I, I have to say there's been so much work done by our people in the past, you know, and, and it's just, I think the audience would have had, um, you know, an insight to how much work our people have done since European arrival and the struggles that we've had to endure and um, when representing our people for our rights and our future. So let's open up the question, um, the floor for questions. There's roving mics around the room. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes uh, and I invite you to make your questions to our speakers. Um, because we've got a shortened question time, I'd like you to keep your questions clear and precise so other people can have a chance to ask a question too. Going beyond the first couple of steps, the very important couple of steps you've been talking about, um, what, how, how will the strategies be developed for going beyond that? So obviously the voice has to be in place that you're talking about. Um, the, the question I prepared earlier was talking about, if you like, broader, broader society learning from Indigenous cultures, so going going in that sort of direction, um, the two way instead of all one way, um, and um, for example, um, I don't know if I've this is just a guess of how to um, encapsulate the two communities, but um, the way I see our urban society is is um, comfort and individuality, is sort of a summary, and. Um, um, and indigenous cultures as uh, expansive connectedness. Um, and even though both are present in both societies, one is driven more by one and the other by the other. And there needs to be some sort of feedback, if you like. I'm wondering if that is the sort of thing that could happen from the voice. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I, I, in some ways, the voice embodies um, a dialogue process. It's, it's mob entering in a dialogue with the parliament who are the democratically elected representatives of, Austra of Australia. Um, but I'm very sure that the voice will facilitate much more than just the functional parliamentary um, procedures, but it will do much more in terms of what you're talking about, the duality out in the Australian community. I think the very concept of the voice, which is a First Nations voice, meaning when representatives speak from the, part, the voice to parliament and you'll see their name and you'll see their First Nation, I think that in itself represents an important conversation with Australians in terms of learning the cultural footprint of, 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 of the nation. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Um, Okay, we have another question. Thank you. Noel, you mentioned um, languages in one of your, the earlier kind of cracks at this nut. Can you speak a bit more about how we bring that back? I'm passionate about how we learn more about First Nations languages, so I'd love to hear how we're going to do that. Australians have got to own the original languages of Australia. And my dream would be that one day 
there'll be communities of white Australians and migrant Australians who can speak native languages. I said to my Lutheran church people a couple of months ago that, you know, you guys ought to be speaking the languages of Hermansburg and Hopevale. The Lutherans of Adelaide and southern Queensland and the um, Darling Downs and everywhere else should be the first people who are speaking Kogimir, Kogialanji, Aranda, and so on. We've got to come to a point where the survival of these extraordinary languages will be dependent on the wider Australian community adopting them and contributing to the recovery effort contributing to sustaining these languages because they are in themselves so precious. They are in themselves so important. And we in Cape York are, are pursuing, as other people right across the country are doing, uh, a concerted strategy for sustaining our vibrant languages but also rebuilding our diminishing languages. It's the heritage of the country. It's, and what recognition I hope will precipitate is a sense of ownership by the wider, you know, by wider Australian community of this heritage, our heritage. I made a point in my quarterly essay some years ago that, you know, most of the place names of Australia are still unrecorded, officially. Most of the names that name the Australian landscape are still unofficial. So my children and I drive past this hill that is a story place, and I tell them that is the Malmuborn, that is the place of the one foot and they look at the map and say, it's a place called Round Hill. <laughs> and the entire continent is, re is just covered with invisible names. Mm -hmm. and, and we seem to be hesitant about owning it, completing the, the naming of the continent. There are places in Cape York Peninsula where there is a place name every 200 metres and a story attached to it. And so it's, I see this as, the, as the, the meaning of recognition, that when we put the architecture in place and we come to terms with one another, we treat with one another, one of the issues that we will have to agree upon is the naming of the country and the preservation of the stories of the, of the landscape. And um, that, is, that is just one part of the, the, the business that still lies undone. Um, Australians are very scared of Aboriginal languages, is my 50 years experience. They're kind of embarrassed. Uh, they... If there's an Aboriginal name for our building, they never say it. And uh, if you know, a whole lot of fronts, there's a people are, I, I find it very strange that Australians recoil from Aboriginal languages. Not all, but I would say, what is the mean position? The mean position is one of. Um, being quite afraid of indigenous languages. And it possibly explains why it is that the polling was so poor in support of it. We are psychologically still afraid of the ancient Australia, I think. We don't know how to deal with it. So, we have another question. 
Uh, as a non-Indigenous Australian, I'm fairly horrified by what I've heard tonight, um, all that you've had to go through. And I've worked in Indigenous communities, so um, I do have some awareness. Um, but when you talk about the people who've told you that you can't take various statements to the public, are these our politicians? Are these our bureaucrats? Um, I mean, it's quite frightening that they feel they can speak for us like that. Which oh, sorry, what? Oh, sorry, would you like to comment? Is that your view on this? Just read my tweets. <laughs> um, sorry, did you, you were, you were saying, you said something about them saying we can't, you're trying to write parts of documents and that the bureaucrats, the politicians are, or people are saying to you that you can't do this, you can't put this statement in, etc. And I'm just wondering who these people actually are because they're speaking for me as an Australian citizen and I'm thinking, you know, I don't want them saying that. So I'm quite interested, are these... Our direct politicians, are these our bureaucrats that we're paying with our taxation? Um, I'm oh, sorry, I just, I just can't remember which statement I was referring to. Just yeah, generally. just generally. I mean, I mean, it is frustrating. I mean, one of the reasons, so the Uluru Statement from the Heart we issued to the Australian people, we didn't invite politicians up to accept it. Every time we do that. It ends up hanging on a wall in Parliament House or sitting in some perspex box. And it gets wheeled out ritualistically. I remember Noel, Arnie, Pat and I did Q&A after Uluru. And when we walked out on the stage, they had, like... It was a Barunga statement, I think, sitting there. And, and I thought, wow, you're, you're extraordinary wheeling that out. Like, that's one of the reasons we're here. Um, but that's what... There's a ritualism around the Australian state accepting all the blood, sweat and tears of mob coming together to conceive of reform ideas, like very serious reform ideas, and then just batting it away as if, you know, nothing happened, like not taking it seriously. Um, yeah. Did you want to say something? Um, it's it's um, obviously frustrating. You know, we're a small minority in a in a country where um, it's you've got to try and win ninety percent of the country, but at the same time um, accept with sweet equanimity all kinds of very offensive stuff. Um, and and try to do things without incurring cost. Yeah, every day is a calculation about if we say this, what will they do to us? Um, the Queensland government stole a school from me because I fought them on other fronts. This guy called Jim Waterston at University of Melbourne, head of the education faculty, killed my school because we were fighting with the Labor government about our rights to development. So every day in Indigenous Affairs, if you're at the front line trying to do real things on the ground with real people, with real challenges, get development going, every day you've got to make a calculation about what you say and what you prosecute publicly and the cost of it. The political cost of it. The bureaucratic cost of it. And we have massive arguments in our own camp about, can we say that? Can we do this? What will be the consequences of this? What will be the consequences of that? And there is no freedom. There is no freedom to be true, to be honest and truthful about what we think about things. It's a constant calculation about how things will play out in George Street in Brisbane or how they will play out in Canberra. And, and we make 
some miscalculations at times that see some political violence, some real political violence. And we can't develop unless we're able to get decisions and make decisions. The wheel has to turn. And me ringing a minister up can, you know, sometimes produce a solution. But wheels can't turn solely on your ability to, to convince a minister on a phone call. Wheel has got to work like it works for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so those are, the, those are the difficulties of pursuing development and change on the ground which is where all of my efforts over the last 20 years have been directed. But every day I work in those stony fields reminds me that unless there's structural change, unless there's structural change that complements agency on the ground, we're not going to close the gap mm. on our disparity in this country. Structural reform has to complement the agency on the ground, the agency, families getting up, jealously guarding the interests of their children, sending them to school, ensuring they're protected, ensuring there's no grog parties in the house, support them in college. The agency on the ground has got to be built. But in relation to the agency stuff, the left condemn us. They impede us. Oh, all this responsibility talk. But in relation to the structural stuff, where the left support us, the right are against us. And that's our kind of difficulty, right? We need both. We need the agency of indigenous people on the ground, but we will get nowhere, ultimately, if there is not structural reform. To have a better life shouldn't be this hard. To vote with your legs for a better life for your children shouldn't be this hard. And for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, too often it is too hard. Therefore, structural reform is imperative. And the right, yeah, the right who support me on the agency stuff oppose me on the structure stuff. Um, they don't realise that they're the beneficiaries of a structure that privilege them and enable them to pursue advantage in life. Well, we want the same thing. We want structures that support us, that enable us. One last thing, Tasmania. There's 600,000 of us, 500,000 of them. They kill off 99% of the original peoples. And they get 12 senators in the federal parliament. That was the deal stuck in 1901. There were more blackfellas at that time of our history than there were Tasmanians. And they got six senators in the deal and another six later on. And you want us to accept a little brass plaque at the top of the Constitution? There's got to be a reckoning about all of this. And the country has not let us talk about Tasmania for too long. It has been, let me say, in honour of Robert, the sole defender of the truth of history during that dark period, during that dark period when the truth in this, of our history was sought to be subverted, twisted. And um, the, the 
behaviour of the then Prime Minister was just... I'm reminded once again how horrific it all was in that period. And... Um, I, I was, that's another point, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm to blame for it too. Why didn't I say something in support of Robert? When the right were going after him with hammer and tongs, we said nothing. Henry Reynolds, Robert Mann, were standing up for the truth against the Prime Minister. And the rest of us sat quiet. And, um, you know, of course, the, the, the way in which the right um, turned on Robert and, um, the, and, and made that horrible man the kind of national historian, mm. faded as Australia's national historian. Um, you know, is a is just one episode we've gone through, which is why the the idea of truth telling about our history came to be so important in the minds of the people that we spoke to in these dialogues. There has to be truth telling about the story, about our a real story. And I continue to reflect, you know, it's difficult to discuss Tasmania politically, yeah? Nobody wants, none of these federal politicians want to talk about Tasmania when there are 12 Senate seats down there. And, um, but, the, you know, the, the real question in my mind is that, you know, the, there was a near extinction near extinction. Robert was right in relation to the stolen generations to use the words genocide. And genocide was the word down in Tasmania as it was in the frontiers of Queensland. And, the, and, and in my cups, in my cups, the moral argument for Australia is that, well, the deal you struck in 1901 gave to those who nearly extinguished a people, mm -hmm. you gave them 12 senators. And you're begrudging a voice to us. There's more of us than there are of Tasmanians. We can't avoid the moral reckoning here. It's a crucial part of what we're doing. This is a moral reckoning. And the, it'll be up to the people of Australia to really um, seize the chance that we have, I think. Fitting time to draw proceedings to a close. Before I, I, I thank uh, um, Noel and, and Megan, I'd like to draw attention to the next uh, talk in this series, which is on July the 16th, when we have uh, Kevin Rudd and uh, Terry Moran, the uh, head of the uh, Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet at the time that uh, Kevin, was, uh, Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister, will be uh, in conversation and it'll be a very interesting follow-up to today. I'm so, sure some of the issues around uh, the way we deal with the issues discussed tonight will come up in that conversation also. It's been an absolutely enthralling evening. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Noel. I'm certainly considerably enlightened about the process that led to the Uluru statement the very extensive process of consultation that 
uh, led finally to such a statement. I've also understand much better than I did previously the need for sequencing, the need for the voice before you could have a Makarata, and the symbolism of the constitutional recognition not being worth very much in its own right. I think uh, the passion that you have displayed, the perseverance, the tolerance of the way your message has been distorted and not heard um, has been very revealing and I think we've all go home um, much informed about the situation. My final plea would be to both of you to keep on battling. It must be frustrating at times. Uh, you must wonder whether it's worth it, but keep going. It really is worth it and uh, I think you have a very considerable proportion of the Australian population behind you. So thank you very much.